In this session, we will be examining fundamentalism, uh, the rise of fundamentalism, as well as its impact. In a previous session, we had looked at um, liberal Protestantism uh, and how it had responded to modern challenge, modern challenges at the end of the 19th century, and how it had taken a more accommodative view towards culture and science. Um, and this is kind of more the conservative backlash. Now, not all conservative Protestants in the 19th and early 20th century were fundamentalists. Uh, but fundamentalism becomes one of the major ways uh, conservative Protestants responded to the, uh, the, the change in culture and some of the changes doing, dealing with science and the study of the Bible. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Now, it's important to remember, or important to note at this point, that fundamentalism developed as a term to refer to a 20th century American conservative Protestant phenomenon. In religion today, uh, we will talk about fundamentalism in a variety of uh, movements, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, we can talk about Jewish fundamentalism, Hindu fundamentalism, suggesting that there is a common set of characteristics that mark fundamentalism. But the term started out as a term used to uh, refer to a specific group uh, within American Protestant Christianity. In his book, Anatomy of the Sacred, a scholar named James Livingston um, laid out a series of characteristics that mark fundamentalism that I think are important for us to, uh, dis to examine um, prior to talking about fundamentalism, especially in light of this idea that there are fundamentalisms in a variety of uh, different religious groups. So one of the first things that Livingston pointed out is that fundamentalist groups are resistance movements. Um, trends in modern cultures like, um, you know, changing morals uh, or increased uh, secularization are viewed as being dangerous by fundamentalists. And so fundamentalisms develop as a resistance to those changes. Um, they develop as a way to respond to and, um, in the eyes of fundamentalists, hopefully eliminate those particular movements and those particular changes. So fundamentalist moves, movements start off as resistance movements. They also look back to a traditional religious culture. Right? There was a time in the past right, that they believe uh, where people accepted and lived by the standards and the ideals of a particular religion. Uh, that, and so it was, it was practiced by everyone in the past. Now for Christian fundamentalists uh, in the United States, this is uh, kind of a upholding of uh, the era of the founding, right? that uh, America was founded as a Christian nation. Uh, some of that we looked at with FIA. Uh, for uh, Muslims, this would be, you know, looking back to, uh, you know, the early caliphates, uh, the early... Uh, stages of the Islamic empire, uh, something similar for uh, Hindus looking back to a, a past in India. Now often these, um, these pasts are imagined past. Uh, they don't accurately reflect what the past was really like. So for example, we've explored how uh, looking back at the founding of the United States as Christian nation is problematic. Uh, there's a lot of uh, historical evidence that suggests otherwise. Um, you know, it, it does suggest the importance of religion, but, you know, that the majority of the founders aren't seeking to establish a Christian nation. Similar types of things uh, with Islamic fundamentalism, the you know, early years of the Islamic empire, um, you know, often featured uh, a lot of oppression as there were uh, attempts to kind of consolidate um, 
you know, the, the power of, uh, of, of Islam. And so there was some oppression on divergent groups. But these pasts are, you know, this is the valid past. Right? This, these, this is what it was real, even though it was really more uh, imagined. Now, because society has moved away from these imagined pasts, which fundamentalists assume to be true, um, there is a feeling among fundamentalists that they've lost something. They should be the true heirs of, uh, you know, their their culture. Right? That this was this is their heritage, and they have lost that by a variety of forces. You know, changes in culture, introduction of new peoples, uh, in, you know, introduction of new cultures, and so there's this uh, there's this assumption that they've lost something. They've dis been dispossessed of their heritage. Fundamentalists also uh, appeal to uh, inerrant, unquestioned sources of authority. Um, you know that these these sources of authority, uh, whether that's the Bible or the Quran, uh, have no errors in them, and they are not to be questioned. And any sort of questioning uh, is part of the degradation of society, and and marks somebody as as being an outsider to, uh, you know, the, the fundamentalist group. Fundamentalist groups tend to be uh, dualistic. They look at the world um, very clearly as being between two separate things, right? The forces of God and the forces of evil are clearly demarcated in the fundamentalist mindset. There's no mixing between them. Everything is clearly right or wrong. Um, now, often... You know, having this very, very sharp line uh, can lead to paranoia, um, especially over those that suggest that the line between good and evil is not always clear. Um, and it can lead to a militancy because the, the forces of evil must be stopped by the forces of God. Now, some of these things uh, we would say, well, isn't there a way in which several Christian groups are like this, right? Just because somebody believes in an inerrant Bible, for example, or somebody believes um, that there is good and there is evil um, in this world and they are not mixed, um, that doesn't necessarily make them a fundamentalist. It's all of these other things, especially the militarism, that distinguishes fundamentalists from other conservative groups. All right, so there's a there's a distinction between a conservative group and a fundamentalist group, and it's kind of that militant component that you know is this resistance, this feeling of dispossession, um, you know, this desire to um, militantly oppose the forces of evil. Uh, that's what kind of distinguishes fundamentalism from um, a uh, you know just a regular conservative type of approach to religion, whether Christianity. Islam or one of these others. Additionally, uh, fundamentalists, um, you know, tend to reject modern culture, but they tend to be those that embrace um, modern technology because modern technology um, is a good way to get the fundamentalist message out. Right? So when radio became very prominent. Fundamentalists got on the radio pretty quickly. Uh, when television uh, started, they got on television pretty quickly. It, um, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden uh, used CNN, uh, the internet, the, you know, the early internet, uh, a couple other things like that, um, you know, to spread his uh, message. So, you know, the, the fundamentalists reject a lot of modern culture, but not usually modern technology. So, fundamentalist Christianity uh, clearly evidences these traits, but for what we're talking about here, what we're talking about, fundamentalism is a militant, often separatist, conservative Protestantism, okay? Um, it has a long line of history, you know, going back to some developments way back in the colonial period and even into the Protestant Reformation, but it fully developed in the 20th century because of some 
things that had taken place in American culture. And we touched on these uh, as we were um, finishing up our discussion of uh, liberal Protestantism. There were divisions that existed in uh, Protestantism, American Protestantism, uh, prior to this, but toward the end of the 20th century, evangelicalism began to divide over a couple of things and that we've already uh, mentioned. Right? There's, there's the division that takes place over uh, this notion of critiques of the Bible, um, higher criticism, uh, other things that questioned kind of how the text of the Bible developed, um, were they the product of multiple authors, uh, you know, uh, a variety of other things that, that question inspiration and, and the origins of the Bible. Uh, there's some challenges from science uh, about the age of the earth, but then really Darwin and, and thinking about the evolution uh, by natural selection of life on earth. Uh, and so calling into question, uh, you know, what, what the scriptures teach regarding um, human beings being a special creation of God. Uh, there was the acceptance of a liberal theology uh, that privileged um, experience, that privileged um, an acceptance of modernism um, with, with pluralism, uh, multiple sources of truth, relativism, Right? All of these kind of things worked together uh, to kind of lead to some divisions between conservative and evangelical Protestants. Now, we talked about the liberal Protestant response, but I do want to take a little bit of a look at the conservative response. One of the ways that conservative Protestants responded to these tensions higher criticism, um, Darwin, liberal theology, was to focus on biblical inerrancy. Now, at its root, biblical inerrancy is the idea that the Bible is literally true word for word. Now, in a sense, Christians have always believed the Bible to be true. And, and since they've always believed that the Bible, uh, as God's word, was free from error, right, inerrancy. But there is a difference in the biblical inerrancy that's developing here at the end of the 19th century. Now, certainly there is the idea, right, that has already been around. The Bible's literally true word for word. It contains no errors in the original. But the notion is that the Bible is a precise document. The statements of the Bible are precisely and fully true. Right? That there's a notion here in this biblical inerrancy of a scientific precision. And so, very, you know, its, its meanings are plain, and whenever possible, it should be taken literally. And so this idea of kind of a scientific quality to truth, that the, what the Bible said is true was exact truth. Right? So if the Bible says it was 483 years for something, it was exactly 483 years, right? If, a, uh, uh, if there's a um, number of uh, soldiers in a particular army, it's exactly true. That notion or that particular way of thinking about biblical inerrancy um, it is something new that develops in the 1870s in response to uh, you know, these, these ideas that are occurring in liberal Protestantism. So there are some elements of biblical inerrancy that go back to, you know, the, the formation of the Bible, and there's others that are much more recent in origin. Um, and so, you know, that's an important uh, development here. But one, in response to people 
challenging ideas about the Bible uh, was the assertion that the Bible is inerrant. It contains no errors, particularly no errors in the originals, right? the original autographs, those things written by the original authors. And that's a, an important uh, marker because the manuscript evidence demonstrates variation, as we've said before, in um, you know textual criticism, right? Some spelling differences, the use of synonyms, right? So there is, in a sense, errors, right? Somebody didn't copy something properly, but the biblical inerrantist would say, no, yes, errors have crept in, errors of spelling, um, maybe juxtaposition of words, dropping of words as, as scribes were copying, but in the original, everything was without error. So biblical inerrancy was one way conservatives responded. Another way conservatives responded uh, was through the development of dispensational premillennialism. Now, dispensational premillennialism, sometimes just dispensationalism, was based on the belief of taking biblical prophecy uh, as literally and precisely true, albeit sometimes taking it very imaginatively. Um, it was developed, now, premillennialism, well, I, let's, let's break this down uh, a little bit before we talk about the historical development of it. So premillennialism has to do with the return of Jesus. There is a belief among some people, a very old belief, and right? this, this goes back to some of the early centuries of uh, Christianity, that Jesus is going to reign on earth physically at the at or close to the end of time for a literal 1,000 years, a millennium. This is based off of uh, interpretations of, of Revelation chapter 20, which talks about the 1,000-year reign of Christ. It does not say on earth, but uh, there are some people that believe it refers to a 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. Premillennialism refers to the idea that prior to the millennium, Jesus' second coming will occur. Now, there were some people in the early 20th century, or excuse me, the early 19th century, and we, we briefly kind of mentioned this previously, that were post-millennialists. They believed that the millennium would occur, and then at the end of the millennium, is when Jesus would return. But premillennialists believed the second coming would occur and then the thousand year reign. Now premillennialism uh, has been around a long time. And we've already looked at William Miller, for example, who was a premillennialist as well. Dispensational premillennialism, however, refers to the idea of there being distinct periods of time that's called dispensations that are a part of human history. And so dispensational premillennialists often will have these uh, very intricate charts, something like what's on the screen here, sometimes uh, as intricate as what we see here, and sometimes even greater than that. So, dispensational premillennialism essentially believes that history, human history, is divided into six or seven, well, usually seven, distinct eras. Usually, the idea is we are in the sixth era, and the seventh era would be the... Um, uh, would be the uh, the millennial kingdom. So in this view of history, there is a notion of this 
that it's essentially this cosmic struggle between good and evil that is taking place between God and the devil. And one should understand biblical prophecies literally and basically seeing these prophecies as being fulfilled. You know, usually the person that believes in this believes that they're seeing biblical prophecy fulfilling itself right now. And so there's a, a very literalistic view that dispensational premillennialists have. Now, such a view tends to be rather pessimistic. The assumption is, unlike the postmillennialist who believed society was getting better and better um, the closer one got to um, the end of time, dispensational premillennialists tend to be uh, rather pessimistic and that it's uh, that society is getting worse and really connected with that of course is the coming of Christ's kingdom but the coming of Christ's kingdom unlike the post millennialists who were engaging in all these uh, reform efforts because they were believing they could inaugurate the kingdom of God by creating a better society the dispensational premillennialist assumes that Christ's kingdom is holy in the future, uh, it's not dependent on uh, human effort, and it will only come with supernatural activity. And it's only through Christ's arrival that will, uh, you know, that that's when, um, th that's when the, the kingdom will arrive. So, the current age, the church age, um, is is basically one that um, is not going to be able to stop the decline of society. And really, for the premillennialist, uh, the dispensationalist, there is a difference between the church and the kingdom, uh, which I think is 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 problematic. There is definitely some overlap in Scripture between the church and the kingdom, in a sense in which. Christ is a king already reigning uh, over his kingdom. That the kingdom is not uh, forthcoming, but is already uh, among us. And a lot of dispensationalists also believe that the church is in decline. Right? So not only do they uh, you know, kind of separate the church and uh, the kingdom, the belief is the church is in decline, that the church is abandoning truth for error, uh, adopting uh, elements of culture that is taking uh, the church further away from what Jesus and the apostles uh, intended. So the focus becomes not on changing society, but on attempting to bring about the kingdom of God, or not attempting to bring about, uh, attempting to prepare people for the, the kingdom of God by individual conversion right, by um, you know preaching and converting uh, souls now these conservative developments are gradually spreading throughout certain forms of Protestantism and one of the people that are the most successful in this is a man named Dwight Moody Uh, Moody was a uh, Chicago shoe salesman uh, until uh, he decided to leave that and focus on the ministry. Uh, for a time, uh, he will be connected with the um, YMCA, um, becomes a president of it. You know, originally the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, was more of a religious organization. Uh, there's still some elements of religion, depending on where the YMCA is. Essentially, Moody decides that you know he wants to gather whoever he can find and bring them to church. 
And so in 1861, he gives up his business. Uh, he decides that he's going to begin uh, preaching. Uh, and uh, by 1870, uh, he's moved from being connected to the YMCA to becoming a prominent revivalist. In uh, 1870, he will say uh, that you know, it's, it's like God has given him a rowboat and said, Moody, save all you can. Right? And so that's kind of the, the motto that is, um, you know, kind of motivating Moody is that, you know, his, his goal is to save as many people uh, as he can. And so he, um, he begins to, um, you know, preach. First, he's not very successful. Uh, he goes to uh, England uh, and uh, a couple other places uh, in Europe and begins to become pretty successful uh, revivalistic-wise, um, comes back to the United States and, uh, again, uh, begins having revivals. A lot of those revivals are focused in urban eras, areas, preaching to people in cities, and he uses his business skills uh, to market uh, his revivals. So again, we have this kind of um, melding of uh, advertising and uh, preaching, uh, marketing a message, uh, much like we saw even with um, George Whitfield back during the colonial period. When it comes to Moody's message, he is promoting inerrancy and premillennialism, but not to the point of making them uh, controversial. Uh, you know, he, he's promoting these ideas, but he's not doing it in such a way that he's causing a lot of problems with uh, other groups uh, that are, um, you know, in existence at the time. Ultimately, his message is really a simple one, positive, you know, evangelical optimism uh, with an Arminian approach, right? Even though he's, uh, he's got some Calvinist leanings, he's, he's also preaching basically that anybody can accept the gospel, that um, essentially eternal life is available for the taking by anyone, right? That they, that anyone can um, reach out and receive salvation. And after after you take salvation, right, after you receive salvation, join a church. For Moody, any church. Right? So he's not preaching a specific denominational allegiance, but uh, he is, you know, encouraging people to be a part of a local congregation of whatever denomination. Uh, and I, I think we kind of see that notion in evangelicalism today, uh, where certainly denominations would like to see the growth of their denominations, but there's also this alternative message of right, all denominations are basically the same, so just find one that uh, fits your style. And that, that's drawn, you know, Moody has a big hand in shaping that. Uh, Billy Graham, uh, who we'll talk about in a, in a, a later session, um, will say something similar, uh, even though Graham was a Baptist. But the focus is very simple, a positive type of approach. With that, there were, you know, he had kind of had these, these stereotypical sins. He is not talking about racism. He is not talking about um, the poor worker manager relations, labor management relations. Uh, you know, he's not talking about these larger issues. It's a focus on a small subset of sins, like people going to the theater, uh, people playing cards. Uh, the, you know, a lot of conservative Protestantism, proto-fundamentalism, focused on, you know, these personal sins, not any sort of institutional communal sins. Uh, people having disregard for the Sabbath. 
you know, people, uh, you know, not wanting to um, go to church on the Sabbath, working on the, on, uh, no, we mean Sunday here. Um, even though he's using the term Sabbath, he means Sunday. So people working on Sunday, do, involved in all sorts of uh, activities on Sunday. Right? These are the major uh, issues that Modi is focusing on. Because like a lot of conservatives and like a lot of fundamentalists will be, and Moody's prior to fundamentalism, he's setting the stage for fundamentalism, there is a belief that individual salvation is going to lead to social salvation. There is not an attention to social ills, social evils. Instead, it is about individual conversion, and individual conversion will lead to um, you know, change great changes in society. As Moody went around promoting this message, there were a couple of things that he um, that he did uh, to uh, promote this message. Uh, he used a lot of narratives, um, stories that would tug at the heartstrings, uh, that would encourage people. Um, that would uh, get them to think about their soul's salvation. Uh, you know, so the focus is on, um, you know, instead of doctrinal or logical type preaching, getting people to accept a certain uh, set of intellectual propositions, the focus is attempting to move people uh, through the use of narratives. Moody also... Um, incorporated a lot of singing in his revivals. Uh, in fact, uh, his song leader, a man named Ira Sankey, uh, traveled with him uh, to lead singing uh, and had a sizable part of the service being singing. Um, a, a method that a lot of people picked up on and continued to use uh, in other uh, generations. Uh, you know, you have this this song leader, and this song leader goes with you to your revivals and leads singing. Uh, Sankey um, also wrote or uh, wrote the music for uh, a variety of songs as well, some of which are still uh, pretty popular. Uh, in both the narratives and the singing, uh, there was a lot of sentimentality. Uh, you're moving people's emotions, you're wanting to, um, you know, get them to have these tender feelings that, um, especially about God, uh, that will motivate them to become a Christian or rededicate themselves to Christ. Now, these are the kind of things, these are approaches that uh, Moody was using in order to bring people uh, to uh, the gospel. And he also uh, worked to uh, avoid any sort of controversy, if at all possible, right? So he is not preaching on, uh, he's not preaching against higher criticism, uh, even though he's against it. He is not preaching uh, against Darwin, Darwinism. He's not getting into these controversial topics as much uh, so that more people would come to his revivals, more people would give him a hearing rather than immediately shut him down uh, because of, uh, you know, a, a specific viewpoint. Uh, another uh, prominent revivalist, as we move into the 20th century, uh, that had an overlap but also a different approach, uh, was a man named Bill, Billy Sunday. Uh, Sunday was born in Iowa uh, in 1862. He was a baseball player, um, his major playing time was with the uh, Chicago White Stockings, which is not the Chicago White Sox. This group becomes the Chicago Cubs. Um, I don't understand all that, but that's what it is. So he, he played for the White Stockings. He played outfield. And um, eventually he decides to quit baseball and starts working with the YMCA. Right? He kind of has this conversion uh, believes that it would be better for him to um, be involved in ministerial or religious type of work. Uh, eventually, he starts um, working with a variety of traveling preachers. Um, one of the most, one of the ones that he most uh, 
commonly worked with for a while is a man named Wil uh, Wilbur Chapman. And, uh, you know, he's these revivalists are going around. He's kind of helping out um, with them. But eventually he uh, goes out on his own uh, and becomes a traveling revivalist as well. Um, much like Moody, focused on the cities. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he becomes very successful. Uh, he, too, has kind of this approach of a uh, pre-revival team. Uh, they will create tabernacles, these kind of wooden structures, uh, you know, wooden uh, auditoriums almost in a sense, uh, to, um, for, for the people to uh, come to and, uh, you know, sit in and uh, listen to, uh, you know, the message. Um, one of the features of these tabernacles was, um, you know, they had sawdust on the floor. Now, you might say, okay, well, they're building these uh, wooden temples. Um, no wonder uh, they would have sawdust. But, no, the sawdust was intentional because it would dampen the noise. Um, it gave a pleasant smell, and it uh, held down the dust. So, it, you know, it was a consequence and a, uh, and a benefit. And so, when Sunday would appeal to people to respond to the... Uh, message right? and to pray for conversion he would tell them to hit the sawdust trail right and and come down forward and uh, you know give me your hand give god your heart um, so the sawdust trail becomes a uh, prominent feature of uh, sunday's revivals he had a simplistic message as well um, very uh, moralistic right? a lot of emphasis on uh, a specific eth ethic, set of ethics. Um, and uh, one of the biggest ones for him was temperance, uh, you know, out dealing with alcohol. Uh, you know, cause he, he pushed people to give up alcohol, not, um, you know, not just moderation. He wanted people to be, uh, you know, you know, completely... Uh, temperate. Uh, such people were referred to as teetotalers, uh, the T kind of standing for temperance. And, uh, you know, Sunday was, was very colloquial. We'll talk about this more uh, in a minute. Uh, but he had these sayings, very straightforward, uh, very explicit. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when he's talking about uh, Temperance, you know, if you're not a teetotaler, he says, you're a dirty, low-down, whiskey-soaked, beer-guzzling, bull-necked, foul-mouthed hypocrite. All right, so very, very much against uh, alcohol. Uh, he was also uh, very patriotic in his message. He uh, was, was very much equating uh, Christianity and America. We saw this um, uh, in the FIA book. And in contrast to Moody, he very much promoted a masculine or muscular form of Christianity. Um, for In the early 20th century, for a lot of conservative Protestants, the, the 19th century Christian had been, Christianity had been too feminine, right? that it had, uh, it had um, been focused on females. And so people like Billy Sunday uh, attempted to make this more muscular Christianity. Uh, and so uh, he, uh, he would say things like, the Lord save us from off-handed, flabby-cheeked, brittle-boned, weak-kneed, thin-skinned, pliable, plastic, spineless, effeminate, ossified, three-carat Christianity. All right, so kind of a rejection of um, uh, a feminine approach to Christianity, uh, a uh, focus on the middle class, the upper class, um, but this more muscular approach. As I mentioned and already demonstrated, he was very colloquial in his language. Uh, it wouldn't be talking about alcohol. He'd be talking about booze, right? So he's using kind of uh, common types of language where some of these other revivalists would have, uh, you know, maybe been more refined in their approach, uh, you know, would have uh, not used common language as, as much. 
Um, he was very flamboyant uh, in uh, his uh, personality. Uh, the, you know, he's um, looking for men of God, not hog-jowled, weasel-eyed, sponge-column, mushy-fisted, jelly-spined, pussy-footing, four-flushing, Charlotte Russe Christians. Uh, very flamboyant. Uh, and although he had a very muscular approach to Christianity, uh, a lot of women loved him. Uh, he evidently was an attractive man, uh, but also, you know, had a very engaging personality, was very energetic in his presentations. He'd smash furniture. Uh, he'd be involved in all sorts of contortions, physical contortions on the stage. Uh, and not just, it's not just about uh, preaching uh, the message. And of course, you know, he's, he's doing that advanced publicity work. Um, of getting out uh, the message, uh, advertising, preparing people for his arrival. And really, you know, that simplistic type of message, much like Dwight Moody, right? The idea is give Bill your hand, raise, uh, you know, uh, raise your hand if you want God's blessing. Um, you know, very simple types of approaches uh, that are shift from maybe earlier messages uh, which and especially colonial Christianity uh, which emphasized kind of a that it was a uh, that conversion was a more complicated process. Sunday too uh, emphasized individual conversion a lot of revivalists were which meant that there was a, a change taking place here uh, in how evangelicals, were viewing the relationship between Christianity and um, culture, societal change. And so scholars have referred to this as the great reversal. You know, we talked about how for a lot of 19th century evangelicals, there was an interest in benevolence, the benevolent empire. Right? There were these efforts to live out one's Christianity by not only conversion, not only seeking to spread the message, but also changing society for the better and uh, working to end dueling, working to end slavery, uh, working to end alcoholism, a variety of other social programs. And that was a very important part of 19th century evangelicalism. However, by the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, there was such a close connection between a social gospel, a gospel that focused on social salvation and liberal theology. And so a lot of conservatives started to back away from this message of revivalism and reform because the social gospel was so liberal in its theological outlook. And so they really started to abandon any sort of attempt on a large scale. You know, that doesn't mean there was complete abandonment of benevolence. It doesn't mean that, you know, individuals and congregations weren't benevolent in helping others, but as far as like a widespread benevolent empire like we see in the 19th century, you know, there's really not the same kind of approach in fundamentalism in these early years because to be socially minded like that was to be a liberal and then you also have kind of the the dispensational model which said no matter what you do you're not going to improve society the only thing that's going to improve society is the coming of Christ's kingdom that's the only thing that's going to lead to any sort of changes in society. And so the importance is to convert as many people as possible. Right? That if you convert people, they will be ready for Christ's kingdom. Now, yes, they will maybe bring some changes but the big to society, but that's not that's not the big goal. The big goal is get as many people saved as possible so that they are ready for the arrival of the kingdom. 
Now, a lot of this that we're talking about so far is general conservative Protestantism, which is setting the stage for fundamentalism. And so as fundamentalism arrives, you know, it's, it's attempting, it, these conservative evangelicals are concerned with the acceptance of Darwinism, higher criticism, and so they begin to create these ideas, these tests for who was holding on to what they thought of as apostolic Christianity and who was adopting liberal theology or modernism. And so one of the examples of what we call a litmus test was the Presbyterian Five Points. Now, originally, the Presbyterian Five Points was a test of the orthodoxy of students of Union Theological Seminary that was developed in 1910. Eventually, it kind of morphs from that to be become a condensed form of what conservatives held to. And so basically, if you believed these things, you were a good Christian. If you denied these things, you were a modernist. And a lot of people believe that they're that modernism was not Christianity. A lot of conservative evangelicals, proto-fundamentalists. One of the major ones, of course, was the inerrancy of Scripture. A lot of modernists did not hold to that anymore. Uh, they might believe that there's something divine from Scripture. They might believe that, that God was involved somehow. But largely, they do not believe that Scripture is without errors at this point. Right, that, there, that, that it's predominantly a human product. A second component of the five points was the virgin birth of Christ. Now, a lot of modernists had largely shifted to an ideology that denied the miraculous. So, you know, they, they weren't accepting of the idea that Christ was born of a virgin, right? A very supernatural type of approach. A third component was the substitutionary atonement. Essentially, this is the idea that, that Jesus' death served as punishment for the death of human beings, right? So human beings should die because of their sin, right? The wages of sin is death. But Jesus substitutes himself and God accepts his substitution uh, as payment for that debt, as payment for the wages of sin. Now, certainly, liberal Protestants did not deny the crucifixion. But they did not look at Jesus' death as a substitution. Uh, instead, they looked at Jesus' death in, in different ways. Some might look at it as... Uh, an example of sacrificial love, or uh, an example of the prevalence of uh, how much sin impacts um, human government. But they didn't look at it as a substitution. Now, substitutionary atonement uh, had been around prior to this, um, but it's really in fundamentalism conservative evangelicalism, that it really starts to become a prominent way to really talk about Jesus' death and what that does for our salvation. Not only was it about Jesus' death, there was an emphasis on the bodily resurrection, um, something that uh, a lot of modernists denied. Uh, if they really talked about the resurrection at all, it would have been more spiritual. Um, and 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 the bodily resurrection here, of course, of, of Jesus, um, and so it would have been a more spiritual discussion, uh, spiritual belief rather than a literal physical coming back to life, uh, as we're seeing here uh, in the in the five points. And then finally, the authenticity of miracles, uh, which a, a lot of people uh, who were modernists or liberal Protestants denied, uh, viewing. Um, miracles in the Bible as uh, kind of primitive ways of thinking that, uh, you know, are we better understand what they really were, right? It wasn't demon possession, it was epilepsy. 
uh, or some other type of uh, physical uh, malady. And so, you know, as fundamentalism is developing, they're creating things like this that will point out who is a faithful Christian and who is not. Because a lot of modernists don't believe these things anymore. Uh, another effort that is developing out of this fundamentalism uh, that is, um, you know, providing uh, somewhat of the, the name of the group uh, was a series of journals, uh, 12 volumes, published between 1910 and 1915, known as uh, The Fundamentals. Various authors in a variety of fields uh, were called upon to uh, write uh, against modernism, higher criticism, Darwinism, uh, other things like that. Um, it was financially backed by a variety of successful businessmen, uh, inclu including a variety of people in the oil industry, uh, all an attempt to, you know, diffuse this message as, as broadly as possible. Um, now, there wasn't a lot of attention to the fundamentals, um, by uh, liberals, um, but it did kind of contribute to the creation of the funnel fundamentalism. Uh, the term itself uh, isn't actually used until the 1920s. Um, you know, we have the fundamentals, the fundamentals of the faith, but it's not really till the 1920s when people start referring to themselves as fundamentalists or saying we are fundamentalists. Um, you know, so it's kind of preparing the way. Um, a key turning point for fundamentalism was World War I. Now, a lot of fundamentalists up until this point uh, were largely apolitical. They didn't really get involved in, in politics that much. But a lot of liberals claimed that fundamentalists were supporting the enemy, uh, or at least were unpatriotic. Um, and uh, professors at the University of Chicago Divinity School, for example, uh, claimed that uh, fundamentalists uh, were being undemocratic and claimed that their attitudes toward the war were harmful. Well, these proto-fundamentalists said, well, it's actually the liberals who are supporting the enemy. Um, they, the liberals had accepted German higher criticism uh, and, and the practice of German philosophy, and that had been part of Germany's moral slide, which culminated in the World War. And so, by accepting the same ideologies, liberals are charting, charting the same course for the United States, and it's going to end the same way. Um, so, because of these attacks, um, fundamentalists kind of became much more militant in their expression uh, of this. Fundamentalism, though, was a broad movement within denominations. Uh, most fundamentalists um, arose within already established denominations so that you had kind of these, you know, fundamentalist Presbyterians, liberal Presbyterians. And a lot of them tended to stay in some of those traditional um, denominations. A lot of them didn't really leave their denominations. There's no real one dominant leader that's driving all of this. Um, you know, this is, a, this is coming in a couple of different places. Now, through the late 19th century, into the early 20th century, by the uh, early 1920s, fundamentalism seems to be gaining a lot of adherence, gaining, experiencing great success. So much so that a liberal um, Protestant uh, minister named Harry Emerson Fosdick preaches a sermon uh, entitled, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And in 1922, uh, it looked like it was quite possible that they would, that they would win, that they would drive out the liberals from denominations, from seminaries, um, and, and be successful. 
they were especially successful uh, with the um, enactment of prohibition, the passage of the 18th Amendment uh, to the, con uh, the Constitution, uh, which prohibited the sale and manufacture of alcohol. Uh, it would be later repealed uh, with the 21st Amendment. But for a time, uh, it looked like fundamentalists were going to uh, be very successful until they took on evolution. Within a few short years after Fosdick's sermon, fundamentalism was on the retreat. And one of the things that a lot of people point to was the Scopes trial in 1925. In 1925, the state of Tennessee uh, had passed the Butler Act. The Butler Act was a piece of legislation, much like legislation in other states, that forbid the teaching of evolution in public schools and in textbooks used by public schools. And so, Tennessee passed a similar measure. Well, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, um, decided to offer their services to any individual willing to claim that they had broken the Butler Act and taught Darwinian evolution in a public school. In the small town of Dayton, Tennessee, some business people decided they wanted to get some national attention. They wanted to get some attention um, and, and thought that by challenging the Butler Act, uh, that would be a way to do that. And so they enlisted the help of football coach and sometimes biology teacher John T. Scopes. Uh, he was charged with breaking the Butler Act. Now, to be honest, it's a little unclear as to whether Scopes actually taught evolution. At the most, it seems he might have handed out some materials that taught evolution. Um, but there's a big question as to whether he actually taught evolution in a classroom. But that's not the big thing. Right? Nobody really cares about that because it becomes about so much more than John T. Scopes. And it garners the national attention that it was intended to do. Uh, famous lawyers uh, joined the case, and uh, this small town garnered national attention. Scopes' defense attorney was a man named Clarence Darrow, uh, a lawyer uh, who was rather infamous for his defense of teenage murderers Leopold and Loeb. Right? So he had garnered a lot of attentions. Uh, it's one of the first cases um, to uh, allow, you know, basically allow uh, insanity uh, as a defense. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he had gotten a lot of attention, um, basically worked by himself because a lot of the defense lawyers did not want to work with him. Um, so, um, He's on the defense side. On the prosecuting side, um, you know, there's the prosecutors, uh, the local prosecutors, but joining them was a man named William Jennings Bryan. Uh, he kind of becomes the figurehead for the pro uh, prosecution. Um, he, Bryan was a well-known fundamentalist, um, had been a uh, three-time Democratic candidate for the presidency of the United States, lost all three times, um, had been a uh, former Secretary of State under uh, President Woodrow Wilson, um, and, uh, you know, had been speaking throughout the country um, against uh, evolution and for fundamentalism. The courtroom was packed uh, every day, uh, it was a it was a media circus. Uh, the national media is down there reporting on the trial. Uh, supporters of various sides gathered to promote their cause, 
Uh, inside the courtroom, it's a different kind of circus. It becomes much less about Dara. I mean, Scopes. Um, you know, it, it's it's less about whether Scopes broke the law. You know, Darrow tries to provide witnesses to promote the scientific nature of Darwinism. And so he brings in all these expert witnesses, but each time he does, he's blocked from doing so. I mean, the judge says that's not, that's not the question. Uh, that's not the purpose of the trial. And so he's trying to argue one thing. Um, it, it gets to the point of absurdity when Darrow calls... Brian, the prosecuting attorney, attorney, to the stand as an expert witness on the Bible. Now, Brian is not a young earth creationist. He does not believe in evolution, but he, does, he believes that there's a possibility for an old age to the earth. So Darrow's asking him a variety of questions um, focused on kind of young earth creationism, and Brian is, uh, you know, not answering him the way that, that Darrow wants. There's other cases, though, where Darrow is asking him questions, um, and, and Brian is unable to really answer them. And Darrow gets the better of the exchange. Darrow, you know, really... Uh, almost to the point of making Brian look like a fool on the stand. Um, but none of it has anything to do <laughs> with Scopes, really. Uh, and, and it has nothing to do with whether or not uh, Scopes uh, broke the Butler Act. Um, some people will say, uh, you know, that, that the trial had had such a, a toll on Brian because he dies just a few days after uh, the trial is over. But it becomes much more than about scopes. It becomes about you know science versus religion. Uh, it becomes urban versus rural, right? This rural town, uh, rural Tennessee. Uh, it becomes about north and south. Much more so than, uh, than just about the question of what did, what did scopes do. Scopes is found guilty of breaking the Butler Act. He is fined a hundred dollars. The verdict is overturned on a technicality. Tennessee law at the time was that any fine over fifty dollars had to be assigned by a jury not by the judge. And so the, the judge here uh, you know, finds him $100, but he actually is, you know, he, he doesn't have the authority to do that. So although Scopes is found guilty, uh, his conviction is overturned. But that's not the only consequence of the Scopes trial. Um, fundamentalism as a term expands. Uh, it becomes used uh, for a wide variety of behaviors and practices, um, still predominantly connected with uh, religion, uh, but you know there's there's still this notion of uh, you know fundamentalism uh, being um, you know it's it's a very broad term uh, equated with rural culture. Um, you know this fundamentalists are, are backwoods people. Now, I mean. In the 1920s, fundamentalism was predominantly a Northern American phenomenon in urban set settings. It only becomes popular in the Southern United States in the 1920s. You know, so prior to this point, fundamentalism was in these Northern urban areas. Um, now, eventually, of course, it becomes popular in rural areas. Um, so. You know, it's uh, it's not rural. It is predominantly white, uh, but it's it's not rural. Uh, it's equated with anti-intellectualism, which, you know, again, uh, is problematic because many of the people that wrote the fundamentals, for example, the articles in the fundamentals, were people with 
higher education. Now, sometimes that education was in um, areas out other than the Bible. It wasn't just the Bible. Um, but, you know, a lot of them were educated, had advanced degrees. But eventually, essentially, fundamentalism becomes a pejorative term. It is not uh, something that uh, people want to be called. Which means what we're seeing here is a transition from fundamentalism being a uh, being so prominent, being so active, to fundamentalism being a negative term, and because of that, fundamentalists start to retreat from society. So. Even though fundamentalists technically won the scope trial, uh, they're losing. Okay. Um, you know, it's they they had been uh, champions and defenders of the American way of life. Now they're starting to be marginalized. Um, eventually, uh, prohibition is repealed uh, by the Twenty um, First Amendment. There is a general antagonism uh, in popular culture for this. Of course, the, there was a lot of uh, media uh, that lampooned uh, fundamentalists and William Jennings Bryan, one of the most famous, was a journalist named H.L. Mencken uh, in Baltimore. Uh, and, and so, you know, he uh, you know, makes fun of uh, Bryan. He'd been making fun of Bryan prior to this. Uh, but this uh, provides some uh, additional fodder for Mencken. Novelists, uh, other creators of popular culture, um, you know, vilify fundamentalists, making them, uh, you know, is, is these ignorant backwoods people or they are hucksters, they are charlatans. Uh, far, fundamentalists themselves don't help the cause. Uh, you know, they... They... Uh, are very uncompromising, uh, militant. They they don't want to be involved and in, in condemn any sort of a compromise with modernism. Very divisive, uh, sometimes turning on each other uh, if it appears like one group is not holding to doctrinal purity as much as uh, another group uh, thinks they should. Right. So fundamentalists are kind of attacking themselves as well. So fundamentalism begins to retreat. They're not completely abandoning um, society, but they, they largely are pulling back. Uh, and in so doing, they decide to be more focused on local. You know, instead of trying to actively shape religious institutions and legislation, um, they're developing their own institutions, their own subculture. They, they cultivated a fortress mentality, according to some scholars. Right? Rather than seeing themselves as the establishment of American religious life, they see themselves as a faithful rem remnant uh, committed to God despite the rest of the nation turning against Christianity um, and, and thinking that everybody else has abandoned um, Christianity uh, and um, the uh, and and the American culture, and so they develop their own subculture. One aspect of this was uh, the use of Bible schools, the creation of Bible schools or uh, Bible institutes, predominantly focused on uh, educating people for the ministry. Right? A lot of the seminaries stayed in the control, the non-nominational seminaries, uh, seminaries stayed in the control of um, modernists. And so fundamentalists, you know, decided to create their own establishments uh, to educate people for uh, the ministry. Gradually, they would create seminaries again. Dallas Theological Seminary is one of the earliest. Um, these were more professionally focused, more rigorous than some of the institutes, uh, but a lot of it focused on fundamentalist doctrines, 
particularly dispensationalism, um, and preparing people to go out and fight for these doctrines, defend these doctrines. Um, now, eventually, some of those Bible institutes morph into four-year colleges um, and universities. Uh, an example of this is the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, uh, which later kind of goes with the acronym BIOLA, so BIOLA University. Um, there are a variety of media efforts, um, people going on the radio, like this individual here, uh, Charles Fuller, uh, fundamentalist, more along the lines of uh, Dwight Moody to some extent, uh, still forcefully upholding fundamentalism, but uh, a softer type of fundamentalism. Uh, we'll come back to Fuller uh, when we look at the rise of neo-evangelicalism. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's this notion of creating these new forms of media, radio, um, newspapers, journals, um, and you know things like that, other types of, of literature um, for uh, the uh, you know the spreading of the fundamentalist message. There was also um, an emphasis on separatism. It was very important for um, fundamentalists to be separate from liberal Christianity. Uh, to be separate from uh, American culture. Both of those things were very important. And there needed to be a separatism. Um, and out of that, um, a couple of um, ministers became pretty prominent uh, as these militant fundamentalists. We'll mention uh, a couple of them. Uh, here. One was uh, Carl McIntyre. Uh, he graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary, was a Presbyterian, a very separatist uh, mindset, uh, began broadcasting uh, uh, sermons, broadcasting his sermons on the radio in the 1930s, uh, started a paper known as the Christian Beacon, would eventually, it was very separatistic, so he eventually had to, you know, start his own denomination, uh, became the Bible Presbyterian Church, uh, would create a semin uh, seminary, uh, became very anti-communist, um, very concerned uh, about uh, Catholics, um, those evangelicals that developed that were uh, rather lenient, they weren't, weren't separatists uh, in the, the 1950s and 60s. Um, largely, he, he begins to decline in prominence uh, in the 1970s uh, and 80s, but he was very militant, uh, creates uh, an organization known, the, known as the American Council of Churches um, as a response to some other organizations that were more ecumenical. Uh, another example of one of these uh, militant fundamentalists was uh, J John R. Rice, a uh, Baptist, uh, very much a hellfire and brimstone preacher, um, very un uh, uncompromising on doctrine. Uh, he would leave the Southern Baptist Convention in the 1920s, uh, criticizing them. Uh, he started a paper as well called The Sword of the Lord, um, became very uh, prolific, um, with uh, books of his sermons, tracts, um, books that attacked a variety of groups, Catholics, uh, Pentecostals, people using translations other than the King James Version. Uh, so he too becomes another one of these prominent fundamentalists. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. Uh, was another of uh, these individuals, a um, Methodist uh, from southeastern Alabama. Uh, he started Bob Jones College in Florida in 1927, uh, moved it to Tennessee and then eventually to South Carolina uh, where uh, it is today as Bob Jones University. His son Bob Jones uh, was in charge for a while and now his grandson Bob Jones III uh, is uh, also running the university. Ultra separatist uh, and a segregationist uh, and, and that, uh, that legacy of segregation carried across um, the, the history of Bob Jones 
university and eventually led to some problems in the 1970s uh, that we'll pick up in a later session um, because it, it's part of the development of the, the Christian right uh, or the religious right. There was still an interest um, in unifying fundamentalism. Uh, so uh, you have a group uh, like the American Council of Churches started by McIntyre. Um, it was an answer to you know, the Federal Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, which was much more ecumenical liberal Protestant, uh, and even the National Association of Evangelicals, which uh, was open to Pentecostals and some other groups that a lot of these militant fundamentalists uh, did not approve of. Eventually, fundamentalism would begin to split. Um, there were in the 1940s some fundamentalists that began to question the separatism of the movement. Now, militants like um, McIntyre, Rice, Bob Jones practiced what some have called come outism. Uh, they argued that. You know, in order for the church to be pure, Christians, that is fundamentalists, needed to remove themselves from liberals. So associating with modernists or being connected with American culture is going to lead to deterioration of doctrinal purity. So you needed to separate from liberals. But you needed to do what was called second degree separation and not separate from anyone who be who would be willing to associate with liberals and so that those people might not be liberals themselves but if they're willing to work with liberals then you needed to separate yourself from them as well the other group which uh, we'll talk uh, about uh, in a later session that comes known as neo-evangelicalism uh, these were modern moderates uh, who were not convinced that the militant approach to fundamentalism uh, was correct. Uh, you know, th they believed that, that they still needed to be involved in American culture. It's basically the same theology, right? Biblical, inerrance, uh, biblical inerrancy, dispensational premillennialism, um, you know, a lot of the same types of views but there's a different sociology, right? And what I mean here is this idea of interaction with uh, culture at large, right? The, these neo-evangelicals, neo eventually just evangelicals, um, were not as separatist. They believed they needed to be in the culture in order to shape the culture. Uh, and so that will lead to a split to these... Uh, split within fundamentalism. Again, the, the theology is the same, but there's a different approach here to culture. And we'll pick up with the neo-evangelical approach to culture in a later session.